Let's see another story. This is uh, the Tower of Babel. Let's go ahead and move into this story and we'll see another aspect of the city and we'll tie all this together toward the end of the teaching. Okay, let's move in now to the Tower of Babel. This is found in the very first nine verses of Genesis chapter 11. So let's go ahead and go to Genesis chapter 11 and we're going to read the first nine verses about the Tower of Babel. Let's read together. Now, the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Notice the language of east and settling. We are already setting up for a sin. Some people don't know what the Tower of Babel sin really is. Let's read what this says. They said to themselves, they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. They said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into the heaven and let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. There's a lot of stuff there. But I want you to notice that they want this tower that they're going to build in this city to violate that earth and heaven divide that we had talked about in our previous teachings. Again, we see a violation of the earth-heaven divide. God sits in heaven and says that is good. God puts man on earth and says that is good. But there seems to be a constant ripping or a violating of that line. We see it in Genesis 6 when the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they came down, right, in unto them. So we see a, a violation there. We see a violation, of course, that Satan, who was once in heaven, is now on the earth, violating that earth, that earth heaven divide. We see it here, where the, the, the uh, tower builders in Babel want to build a tower that pierces that divide. Okay, let's go on. Verse 5. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language, and this is what they begin to do, and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, the one thing that they feared, he does. And they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Okay, so another interesting story involving city, people, settling, going east, building a tower that pierces that earth-heaven divide, and God saying, time out, this is not going to work right now. I have to put a stop to this right now. And when he stops it, they stop building the tower and they stop building the city. This is part of the judgment again. So the Tower of Babel, we see two things. They want to build a city for themselves, just like Cain, and they want to make a name for themselves. Notice what it says, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into the heaven and let us make for ourselves a name. In this ancient act of rebellion in Genesis 11, men were tired of being named and they wanted to create a name for themselves. These men supposed that happiness could be found in independence in autonomy, when they say they want to make a name for themselves, they're not saying that they want, to, they want to become popular, right? They're not saying that they want to 
you know, be on the cover of some magazine, right? That's not what they meant in these times. They make a name for themselves. They want to express their independence. They want to make a name for themselves. In the city, man is all powerful. In the city, man makes his own laws. In the city, man manufactures his own rights. He creates new rights. He creates new rights, not just for himself. He creates new entities in the city that can really only operate in the city, like corporations and other things, and he gives them rights. In the city, man is all-powerful, at least he thinks. In Babel, they were tired of a life separated from men to God. They sought to reverse God's command. They didn't want to be scattered out across the face of the earth. They did not want to fill the earth and multiply, right? What the Bible continues to say, the same thing that God says to Adam when he says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He says the same thing to Noah, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. But we see men saying, no, we don't want to fill the earth. We don't want to be scattered over abroad over the earth. We want to come together. We want to come together and build a city. And the very first person who does this is a murderer, and he is fleeing the presence of God. All city builders during this time of Genesis are the sons of Cain. So when God comes down to remedy this situation, he confuses the tongues. He stops the integration of man into the city, and he stops his attempt dead in its tracks. He says, come, God says, let us, let us. Now that right there, that word, that phrase, let us, implies that there is more than just him, right? There is us. He is an us. Some people get hung up on God's nature. They say, well, I don't understand the, I don't understand how God can be above my thinking, right? And, and then you just say, well, that's, that's right. That's what it is. Your ways are not God's ways. God can be us and you can't. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. He confuses the language. Of course, we see this confusion of the tongue actually reversed on the day of Pentecost when the men were gathered together in the upper room where the disciples and the apostles spoke in all languages and those around them could, under, could understand those languages. Quite a, a show of power by the early church and by the Holy Spirit there in that early church. Modern man is driven to finish the building of Babel. It's his desire to build a city. He strives for global unity. He strives for global government. He strives for global economy. And this is what we saw in the Tower of Babel story. It's very interesting that right after we see Cain in chapter 4 building a city, and then we see the Tower of Babel being built in Genesis 11 along with its city, that God does something in Genesis chapter 12. Immediately after the story of Genesis chapter 11, and there's a genealogy there, immediately after that, we see the call of Abram. Now, Abram is living out east. He's living in a pagan world. Abram was a pagan. Abram was a pagan Babylonian. He was a pagan Babylonian. He lived in the town of Ur of the Chaldees. His father was certainly a pagan. He lived in a pagan world. But God calls him out of the city. And he says, come or go forth from your country and go to a land that I will show you. Now, God is going to build his city. He is going to build his city. Now, here's what I want you to see. Boy, this, I tell you, this is we're not e we haven't even scratched the surface yet. I don't know how we're going to get all this done. We might have to break this up into two teachings. There's a lot here. God's original plan in the Garden of Eden, we don't know where all that was going. We don't know. But here's what we do know, is that his solution is a city 
called New Jerusalem. I want you to understand that Satan very likely knows what God had prepared. He saw, no doubt, he saw the, the uh, human beings being made. He knows our frailties. He knows what God had purposed, very likely. Maybe not all of it for sure, but surely he has a little bit of a glimpse of what God was trying to do. Because we see Satan constantly ripping off God by counterfeiting him. So God's solution is the new Jerusalem. It is a city. God's solution for man is a city. Cain desired a city. Was his desire for a city wrong? It's interesting. He was right to desire a city, but he desired the wrong city. Abram desired a city whose maker and builder was God, but it was unseen. It was a city that Abram couldn't see, but he was motivated by it. But Satan uses his sons, Cain, the Tower of Babel, to create a counterfeit version of New Jerusalem here on the earth. The desire for the city within men, you can't deny it, there is an allure to the city. It attracts men. That desire for the city is not wrong because it really is what God is going to provide us with. The new Jerusalem will be a city. But what we have today are perverted versions and counterfeit versions of that city. The very first time we see the Israelites, they are building a city. And God calls Moses out of the city to the back side of a desert and then after a period of time calls him back into the city to bring his people out of the city. The first city of the, the chosen people build is for Pharaoh during their bondage. The people of God find slavery in the city of man. A large component of the people of God's slavery in Egypt was in building a city. The values that many Israelites learned in the city, in this Egyptian city, would then be translated to pollute other cities that would later inhabit Israel. Much of what was learned in this city would later be transferred and passed on to other cities of Israel. So the city of man is is made with the hands of men. It's not made with the hands of God. Those things that are done strictly for the glory of man receive no respect from God, and they will certainly not last into eternity. The city of man represents man's self-reliance and his opposition to God. The city, in many ways, becomes the result of a man fleeing the presence of God. Man ceases his wandering in the city. He settles in the city. The city offers him a sense of security. It offers him a sense of relief. It offers him a sense of of community. It's a place where he can pursue what makes him happy. The city is a place where a man can go to hide. But what man cannot see is that the city only offers slavery. There is no freedom in a city. The freedom offered by a city is a farce. But this is man's greatest triumph. Man's greatest triumph is the city. This is the greatest work of man's hands. And the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that all of the cities will fall in a moment. All of the cities will fall in a moment. And yet this is where man builds and builds and builds. It's where he 
exercises absolute power. It's where he finds security. It's where he creates creature comforts to suit his every whim, to make him forget the reality of his situation. The city is where man is king, or where he thinks he's king, but in fact, he is nothing more than a slave. The city of man represents a perversion and a counterfeit of what God had intended from the very beginning. The city is cursed. Throughout the Bible, when we see God speaking to the city, we see a message of great condemnation. We see a message of judgment. We never see God make a covenant with man's city. He makes a covenant with man, but he doesn't make a covenant with the city of man. The city represents the cumulative efforts of man. You know, the Bible is also largely a story of two cities. Uh, if you go back and look in the Old Testament, of course, even in the New, you see this back and forth of Jerusalem and Babylon. Babylon, of course, a huge part of the very last book of the Bible, Revelation. The book telling God's people, come out of Babylon. Come out of her. 